sound like you have breakfast for lunch. Let's do this one more time. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. That's strong. That's very good. Because today's lecture is about masonry. Masonry is a, such a strong, strong construction process. And the material used for masonry is amazingly durable and strong. So I like your strong response to Platinum. And uh, it's an honor for me to give this lecture. And I feel very honored uh, because this is a very important material, very important. Masonry is a very important construction process. And I love to share what I know about Mason with you. So I feel very honored. Because we go through quite a few weeks of uh, life training, construction systems. And we're past that now. We are moving to the second half. We have this masonry material in perspective today. So if you have a question, you can ask me. So uh, I just don't think the time will be on my side. So I have a few videos to share with you today, if I get a chance to. If not, I have to skip it. So masonry is the process of building structures using individual units. And they are not just one material, they are actually quite a few materials, such as traditional you know, brick, stone, concrete block, glass block, even adobe clay. They are actually quite a variety of nature materials we talked about here. The units are held together by motor, which is a mixture of cement, sand, and water. So one of the primary examples, what well, primary example? Most of the ancient architecture buildings, structures, that was to see today are made by masonry. Otherwise we wouldn't get a chance to see them as a thousand years ago. So when you look at these, I'm just using some of the real example rather than the, the pyramids, some of these structures we're reading them. This is the one actually in Iraq. And also we have the Great Wall of China, which uh, Mason is one of the oldest building crafts in the world. The construction of Egypt, pyramids, Roman aqueducts, medieval cathedrals, are all the examples of Mason. Early structure used the weight of the masonry itself to st stabilize the structure against lateral movements. So the weight of the masonry somehow comes to balance the earth movement and also the wind lateral movements, making it very, very strong. So one of the examples I like to use is always the Great Wall of China, which from 1368 to 1644, actually dated even earlier, it takes quite many years to construct the great wars you actually see from the outer states. To today, more recently, we have a mother dock buildings in Chicago, built from 1889 to 1891. Then we have the church in Denmark. The Topology of human productions methods, quoted by G. Semper. Style in the technical and tectonic arts or practical aesthetics. He said that there's four original methods of production since the dawn of the day when we first produced. And we can call that civilization. The first original method is called weavering, by two materials that wave, one material wave in two patterns repeatedly. Then we have 
the discovery of pottery. We use the clay, and we dry the clay. We go through the kiln process to make this harder. Then we have the tectonics, the timber construction that we love to use. And it's called figuring, the process in the uh, jewelry ornamentation. Then we have the stereo farming, which is mason construction. The knot as a representation of technical solution is the oldest technical symbol. And they actually can trace many thousand years ago and we use the knot to represent a very significant events in history. The prime motive of human technique or call it craft because of structural necessities. The connection of two elements become an aesthetic and meaningful image. Prefab. This a holocaust break that we call them to know. They are a prefab, prefabricated materials, which the first prefab building system of humankind. And this is what we did in a place of batteries. Then we ship the bricks to the site to construct the structure. The adobe clay, the history of adobe clay, which didn't go through the kiln process, can date back 6,000 years ago. So in no way, no meaning, break is new. Break has many years of history. Now, when we talk about masonry, we talk about break, and we are talking about using one hand to hold the break. So, the dimension of the break is somehow work around our hand. As soon as we talk about the dimension, we will wait. With a CMU, concrete mainstream units, which we can hold with two hands. The thing that bonds the mainstream units is called bonds. There's so many types, so many variations. And we get a chance, we're going to discuss some of them, not all of them, there's so many of them. And one of the English bond and Flemish bond are the most popular ones. So from the pyramids to flying buttresses to Gothic architectures to St. Cathedral in Florence, to Roman aqueducts. They are all built by this historic masonry, the process of construction. <clears throat> to more recently, from the Industrial Revolution to today, we we'll continue to use this process to fabricate our idea, our imagination. <laughs> Louis Mies Mandero once said, the break is a different master. How ingenious, a small and handy, useful format for every purpose, what well, the logic there is in the bundle. What the spiritual is in the joints, what will of it is and even the simplest wood surface. But what at this point this material demands? He says that in order to achieve the mastery of masonry, it takes years of practice. And this wonderful things, this wonderful materials, it just takes years to last. And he's right.
So Great Country House was a project by architect by Amis van der Rohe in the early 1920s. It was a visionary design that explored new ideas about architecture of homes in construction. It was never built, actually. But it influenced Mies later on and his reputation. So this is one of the projects that is on the paper and has never been really built. In. But it gave him the stage to experiment more. Because he said, Greg's take a very long time to master. It's something that you cannot just take as granted. You need a, a lot of experimentation. He certainly did that in his, this project. One of the very important things making a break construction so durable and so strong, we have to look at the bunking, the mortar that on each individual unit. So the process is an A categorized. First one is the exact horizontal courses. We really make sure that the horizontal line up. Regular alteration of structures and head. The structure is this position of the break. And when you turn around, it becomes head. Uh, we'll get to it, so nothing to worry about. Just verbally talk about the big points. Maximum amount of header in the core. The header actually straightens your break wall by positioning them in different directions. They are close apart to each other. Make the header bond strongest in the wall. Um, maximum amount of the full breaks, the closer three quarter breaks, only when necessary. Head joint should continue through the thickness of the wall. Head joint of two successive courses, offset by quarter to half of the length of the unit. And number seven, corners and intersection, the back joints continue structure course. The last one, not the least, the internal one. The head joint offset in successive courses. Those are the eight points of the principle that we need to follow. And we're talking about English talk, one of the most popular following. So the basic breakboard terminology is we have First of all, is the course. The course needs to be horizontal, keeping in mind, not crooked, not tilted, not stepping. Any variation actually weaken the break wall. The width. That there's a two width, two courses of a break, and you leave a space in between. Bad joint, which is more make sure the bad joint is mortar enough, so they will be joined each courses of the break, break courses. And each header, which is the vertical part, need to be closely spaced and consistently spaced. Now this is the position of a break. It's called stretches. When the break is in lane, like stretching. And when you turn that around, this is called a header. Now if you tilt them the other side, if you tilt them right, they look like what? They look like a soldier. A soldier marching, right? And this position is called soldier. And then we tilt it. This position is called the roll up position. But the header, 
when you rotate it in different direction. And this course of close stepping header joints and actually make your break more stronger. Now, when the wall are joined together, we have to pay attention to the joining. Because each type of bounce create different joints. So these are the things, the joints that we have. We have to look at these in terms of repetitions. But most important is the joint. Because those are the details we look at. Each bond, they join really differently. We have a structure bond, common bond, Flemish bond, English course stacker bond. Of course, the stacker bond is the weakest among all these bonds because they're not really interlocking each units together. And when you look at the common bond, which is six courses for Flemish, and common bond somehow changed to five. Uh, so they somehow look a little very similar, but they're quite different. It's like, for example, stretcher bound, you put the top course, the soldier bound, soldier on top of your wall, and it becomes soldier course. And the soldier course on top of stretcher bound. So these bound actually will give you a different looks and also the strength of each masonry wall vary quite dramatically. Okay, planning with a break dimensionings, these are the standardized dimensioning, okay? Uh, for example, three courses, you have about the length of eight inches. These are nominal dimensions, I mean they are like seven, three, eight of inches. So they are not really measured eight inches. But we, we just, well, just ground to eight inches, give and take. And then we have three inches, two joints, with three eighths of inches, totally we have 24, three quarter inches. Now if we put them in different position, like the header, we have three and five eighth inches plus two eighth inch, uh, eight inches, and then we have three and five eighth inches of the header bounds. That will give you a totally different dimension. So break the nation of the different courses, not necessarily the same. The main course for a geometrical concept Double check on the second course. Coordinate the window door opening and no material change for break because you can't switch it out of material. Those are some of the principle of planning with the break when you consider the nation. Now the case study, we have the experimental house by Abadam. And you can tell that he used different types of arrangement in one of the facade of the house. That is like, you know, he tried to do a test to do what, well, how'd that come out? What would you interpret this? What would be the way? So he's trying to play around using different positions, different variations. today is called a city hall paper, made by a company just outside of Boston the same way for centuries. No matter where you go in Boston, you look at the sidewalks, you look at the buildings, the brick veneer, this is the brick you're going to see. So here we are, we're down at the factory, 120 years old, it's been run by the same family for four generations. I'm here with Lincoln Andrews. Hey Lincoln. Hi Mark. 
explain a little bit about the brick form. Absolutely. It's used throughout New England, from Maine all the way down to Connecticut, wow. on some of the most prestigious locations there are, such as the Freedom Trail, Boston City Hall, Beacon Hill, Harvard Yard, Martha's Vineyard, and Nantucket. Wow. What makes this brick so great for the New England area is the indigenous clay and the way that we process it. If you look at it, Mark, you'll see that it's not perfectly square and there's slight non-uniformities to it, which I'm sure you're familiar with. That's my favorite part of the brick, actually. Yeah. Exactly. So what happens is that because the brick are not perfectly square, when you lay them out in a pavement, you'll see an entire colonial pavement rather than one individually perfect brick. Wow, great. That's what makes this brick so unique. Would you like to tell the brick of me? I would love it, man. Let's go. Let's go. All right. This is where the process begins. A dump truck comes in with a raw material, dumps the clay into this machine called a pug mill. Okay, so a pug mill, what's that do? Is it just a big mixer? Yes, exactly. The pug mill takes this raw clay. Oh, yeah. It's kind of wet right there when you know. Exactly. It's wet and it's kind of gritty. Yeah. But it starts to mix the clay and make it homogenous so it becomes more smooth. Okay, okay. How many brick can I get out of this load right here? 5,000 brick. 5,000? Wow. We make 10,000 brick an hour on the brick machine. Oh, wow, that's great. So this is the brick machine. It's pretty simple what it does. It takes that mixed up clay and it presses it down into a mold. The mold is then pushed out and it leaves a nice clean stripe on the clay. This is a freshly molded brick. Pick it up. Oh boy. I don't, I don't think I can lay that one here, man. It's nothing more than a foreign piece of mud at this point. It's really wet. In fact, now we have to dry it. Uh, we're going to bring us over to our next step of the process. Okay, let's go. Great. So then we bring the bricks and we push them into the brick dryer. Okay. And these bricks now are already dry. Right. They've been cycled for about 22 hours and they're just finishing up. Wow. So what's, what's this? What am I in right now, Katie? You're at about 200 degrees or so. That's why it's called a dryer. It's really not that hot, right? But we have taken one pound of water out of every single brick. So this is still a lot bigger than what I, mean, I usually lay. That's exactly right. But then when we bring the brick into the kiln, it's going to become even smaller. Now we're going to our brick kiln. It's round. It has a film-shaped ceiling. Sure. So we call it a beehive kiln. Now we right. fill 85,000 brick inside this kiln. 85,000 brick. Unbelievable. What could you do with 85,000 brick? Like I could build a school with 85,000 brick. So we're here at a kiln now that has just finished firing for five days at 2,000 degrees. We're going to pop the lid off the kiln and start to cool, that, cool it down. Okay. We're going to roll up the sleeve, lift the dome cover off of the kiln, which Jim is going to do right now. All right. Yep, there's the dome cover. Wait till you see inside. Wow, unreal. Look at that. Oh, those bricks are 1,950 degrees Fahrenheit. We dropped the sleeves down so we can suck the heat and bring it over this dryer to dry the bricks so it's not wasted. Wow, unreal. How long is it going to take us to be able to use the bricks? Three days from 1,950 degrees down to 120 degrees where we can unload the kiln and send them to the packaging machine. Mark, these are fired bricks that have come out of the kiln. Okay. Oh yeah, that's a lot cooler. So, Lincoln, when I'm laying the brick on a job site, all we do is we take it right off and right into the wall. I know there's a blend here. That's exactly yeah. right. We sort for size and color and also mixture. So if you notice, Mark, we have a blend here. We have 85% of these red brick right here and 15% of those browns to black. We sort them together and then the bricks are going to be strapped into the cube. You're ready to go to the job site. All right, well, I need one more cube on the job in Ireland, but I wanted to say thank you for the tour. It was outstanding. Anytime. All right, Lincoln. Well, so uh, that's the process of one, one, you know, one factory. I mean, every factory is all kind of different. Uh, their source of clay will be different. Uh, their drying process also vary. I mean, that determines different kind of grade of grade. Uh, one of the tunnel kiln, which is a big tunnel, and is between 800 to 2400 Fahrenheit. Still pretty, not pretty, pretty hot. The other one is beehive, and they're actually 2000 Fahrenheit. But this is only 
not sure the period of time, one to two hours. I take about a couple of days. Um, a bound is a modular system. A modular means they have a variety of sizes. And typically, they are three and a half inches, uh, three and five eighths of inches, which bound material matrix is 90 millimeter. Typically, and the, the variation is so small. Um, then you have the king and queen size with three inches, a little smaller. And there are different types of breaks. There are core budget, which we look at the New England play, uh, break. Well, hop the solid break. Uh, one of the uh, break swing house used the uh, very clever of the same system to create a screen effect. The next one we talk about the CMU, the concrete masking units, which they are structurally reinforced because you can put reinforcement in one of the core, make them look very strong. The motor bonds, which is the most important part of your brake wall. The content is polar cement, hydrate lime, aggregate, fine coarse aggregates, and water. They assimilate cushions, angularity of brake, naturally the surface of the brake is proper, irregular, it actually helps the motor to bond them better. And they also help to seal against climate, weather, such as wind, rain, water. The adhesion bonds you need into a simpler metallic structure, like a missing one. Uh, the content I already talked about it, and the proprietary formula formulation, and they call variation of different colors. They are type of brake. They have MMSO. And M means the high strength motor. And they are roughly minimum of average of uh, 2,500 pounds per square inch. That you kill for 28 days. These motor joints, they also need to kill time. And then we have the S, which high, medium high strength motor. They are 800 pounds per square inches. And then we have N, which is uh, medium strength motor. They generally use above the grade, not below the grade. Uh, they are 750 pounds per square inches. As the number goes down to the last one, the O, which is a medium low strength motor joint, and they only roughly 3,500 square, a pound per square inches. They are ready for non-bearing wall, or maybe interior wall, that are not exposed to weather. And then the facade is used to hold. Excuse me, I can't hear you. The facade is used to hold. Well, when in the times that you have no low bearing, you may be using them for decoration, ornamentation, and they are not outside exposed to severe weather. And you use those type of grade for that purpose. So the motor, actually, the mixing of the motor bond, they are into a different motor types, okay? And they're very important for the strength of your mixing wall, the brake wall. The motor joint also come for different types. They are typically made by the tool. They have a weathery joints, concave joints, V joints, racket joints, strut joints. The last one is the flash, the flash joint. The flash joint is the most expensive one. 
more most laborers when you think about why. They simply flash why it's so beautiful. And because there's no tools, so you have to make sure they are flat. So they're mostly labor intensive, is the flash joint. Now some of them are not weatherproof at all. Like reed joints are very weak. The water can go inside and crack your motor joint. And the water can zip into it, destroy your breathing. Ragged joints pretty bad. Structure, forget about it. The weather joint is okay. It's okay. Because the wind don't go all the way up, they go gravity going down. They're okay. They're not great. Concave is very good. And flash is, if it's done correctly, it could be one way to prove. It's just very laborious. All right. So each joint use of different condition. If you are using for interior wall or with a roof over over it, really don't have to worry too much. And you can use the, you can use bacon. They give you, when the sunlight shed your amazing wall, your brick wall, they give you kind of different feeling. So they are okay to use if there is no rain. When you look at the rain, the water, you also have to take a look at the consideration of your wing pressure, because wind can move this water into your joints. So they need to be considered. The grout problems, when you look at the grout on this one, and the obvious this is a new, this is actually repointing, is when you see a visible damage of the brake and also the joints. So time you need to repoint them to take them out, put a new grout, and you finish. This is called a repointing process. Some of the brain need to do that, because you can see my eye, the weather has deteriorated brain. Uh, stacking means the water is leaking into it. Probably there are metal inside, or something that push, frost and push the wall. And that consideration is also a corner, also a lower part of your Great one. So you need to really seriously consider three points and three fingers quickly before you collapse. This one we know the water basically just draining through it and making a big mess. So this entire one needs to be repointing. This is one of the look like it's extruded joints, held not correctly. So through the years, the wind pressures accumulate the water along the face of the brakes, slowly deteriorate the wind. Ah, uh, they're creating a problem. Durability, different brakes, made for different weather. Now we look closely by color of gray, we have the severe weathering along the east coast. Then we move along to this mid of the United States, they become moderate weather. And they go to the southern part, Florida, Texas, those states, you have negligible weather. So each region requires different type of grades. You have, like Northeast New York, we already need an SW, uh, severe weather, <laughs> weather and grid, SW grid. Because we are cold, we're sometimes hard, so SW grid should be a popular choice. Now with the middle, midwest of America, you can use the moderate weather, NW. In the southern part of 
United States, like Florida, for example, you really don't need to because they don't have too much weather problems. They mostly want use in the And type of uh, your brake, the facing, also come with different rates. A uh, different rate also this got to do with the price of the brake. The FBX type, which high degree of mechanical protection, they look very really nice. They use for exterior wall and it costs the most. Then we have ABS, which wide range of color and greater size variation. Very little bit, the color is very little bit, and then moderate price, moderate price. And then we have FA, FBA, which is, it comes with different colors. <laughs> it's like the bat, <laughs> they don't make any good, so they move around in another pile, and they're used for, not for a structural war, they're used for something else, and they call FBA, and they're cheapest. Uh, you look at Greg's bag, the way it was being produced. You have the extruded type, which is through the through a molding. Uh, they call it extruded. You can also put it into a mold. It's a mold, you know, uh, the consistency of the clay is less rigid, it's more flexible to use a molding. And then you have the hangman, you use a hand to make them. The size is always change. They are not synthesized, but they somewhat like a name craft into it. The repairs. Break masonry was need repair. In your city, we have a local load 11. In the old day, we call local load 10. Now, it's Local 11. Require the building with more than six story has their exterior wall and um, a putting nests that are attached to the facade, such as including balcony railings and fire escapes. Inspect for every five years, the local Local 11. The way we inspect them is by looking at them outside with the vernacular is to see them how the crack going on, whether you have tooth type cracking, stack cracking, vertical, horizontal cracking. We have to note it on our report because they're very dangerous. While the brake and fall from loose and fall from the building and drop and kill or harm the pedestrian. They need to be scaffolded and renovation plan is being place every five minutes. Now you heard about this story when you were in childhood, when you were a young in the kindergarten. And there's a story about great pigs. You have the youngest pig that, oh, I'm, I'm smart. I'm going to build a house with the straws. <laughs> so the youngest of the family come up with, no, I put this age into the story because, you know, and then you get to the, the second brother. He thinks he's smart. He said, I'm going to use wood to construct my house. The oldest, the oldest of the family, of the two kids, he's wise. He said, oh, I'm going to make my Break house. <laughs> Guess the big bad wolf coming. Blow away the uh, straw house easily. Keep the wood house into pieces. When he confront with the break house, nothing he can do. <laughs> it's so strong. And that matter of fact, save all three brothers from a big launch of dinner away from the now we all heard this story. And it's true. The masonry construction is durable, strong. It lasts thousands of years. 
Every stack of it. Every stack of it. If it's done incorrectly, within 10 of years, <laughs> you're gonna have a problem. Probably the first six years. Now, great as a building system, really some of the things we talk about the advantage is is disadvantage. So we don't really separate them into advantage or disadvantage. But it is very flexible. You require effort. You require planning, and you need also a person who know great. I've worked with great for a number of years. You cannot pick people from the street. Say, hopefully, they're coming. I need some labor. <laughs> because they will be very useless when they're looking at the, the break world. There's nothing they can do. They are learning <laughs> because maybe they make the first mistake when they're holding the break. They made a mistake already. So, so the labor is you need a skilled labor. The speed of the construction is slow because it's one break at the time. Versatility. Great job troops we can achieve with the brick units. We can create many type of patterns, type of geometric form. Hence, we create different kinds of brick construction or masonry. Transportation is very easy because they come with a unit. Look, if it's bundled, you can ship them prefab, and power can be constructed in the factories. It's surely very sustainable because <laughs> they come from indigenous uh, materials from the neighborhood, not from far away. Because you can find clay anywhere, you can find stone anywhere. So they're very sustainable. The installation quality well depends on the location. Because the stone can absorb heat very quickly and store the heat and release the heat slowly to the nighttime. So stone mostly using hot array climate, like the desert, because Desert at this swing temperature during the morning time, and it's kind of cold, and then it's gradually in the noon time get very warm, and the night time get freeze up very quickly. So using stone, you will store the energy and slowly release the energy during the night time. But if in the cold climate or temperate climate like New York, we're really talking about average insulation. Uh, we still need insulation enhancement in the cold climate. But high rate is a great, great material. Porosity and up water penetration. The water can't penetrate through the wall. So this is the reason why we leave a space and also weak points. So the water can get out from the mason. Raw material availability, always available, everywhere. The material, material cost can be high, okay? That is a break, use a kiln process, this take money, and they're very heavy, and they cost a lot of money to ship to the place. Building maintenance is low. They built correctly last year. The spinning, by the normal spinning idea, it doesn't really spin too long. But there are a lot of ingenuity in masonry construction done by the Roman, by the, uh, many cultures. They would do like Roman arches, vaults, we're gonna look at them. So they actually have way, very innovation I have to spend very long, like 144 feet. The bearing capacity is great. Masonry more has this compressive strength, not parallel with any other material in this world. It has also great fire resistance rating. It's very high. If 
it's not enough, you can add another width of brick. Then you can enhance it, make them even last longer. The weight is an advantage because the weight of stone or masonry materials are very heavy. So they are great for lateral forces. They naturally counter against wind loads and earthquake. But also is one of the detriment of the masonry materials, the deck loads. Because they're very heavy. Installation. Now, I want you to pay attention to this process because it's very smart and every mason knows how to do this. They start with a corner. They start with a, they first of all start with a corner, then the edges. For a reason. What's the reason? Why they always stop with a corner? I think you're trying to say is actually this corner make a good arrangement of the course so they can continue from one end all the way from the all the way to the top as they graduate here in Darwin. So they can keep every course to be exact in the same linear fashion. So the wall will not be tilted or stacking. We can the mason construction. So this is why it always start with the corner and then slowly build up the rest of the ground. And that's a very smart way to start with installation. So break hold in one hand, the foundation marks stubbly on the corner in the motor bed. Each course must be level, straight, plumb. Go all the way. And the corner also very difficult because that's where the joint of two walls. Each course must be level, straight, plumb, fill in between complete legs with stretched line. The concrete measuring units are very similar. They also start with the corner and then continue the rest of the process. Very similar, similar process, but they hold with two hands. And you run them out They come with the, the same, you come with different configuration. The one of the most uh, uh, famous one is called the bonding, channel bonding. It was like C channel. This is mostly used for lintel and also for your good, your beam, all right? Because you can put reinforcement, reinforcing bond inside. And they are three eighth of inch, three and five eighth of inches, run up to four inches, to six inches, eight inches. And each one of them have a different name. You have regular structure, one end plan, steel sash unit, four inch high stretches, and you have paving. So, this is a very popular lintel, which is you have a window opening. In the, uh, the section of masonry work construction, you also see them being noted as bomb thing. Uh, they work very well. They're actually very nice. 
and it also can use for to open such a window and so on for the bump to be used. What a lot of slides, so we you know we only have way through, so we need to do this very quickly. One, the Mexico construction. And actually use the hollow brake and you are able to pull up planks of a flower bed being created. It's very innovative. And we're gonna do very quickly. Then we have the final rights, the Miller House, 1923, and his other houses that use textile blocks, which if you look closely, that is the textile textile block that Reinforced actually can use the metal steel wire can be can be run them out, keep it extra reinforced. This type of uh, construction proves to be very durable. Also great for earthquake too. I mean one of Rice House Imperial Hotel tasted in Japan uh, are doing pretty good. And I am currently standing within our Annie Pfeiffer Chapel, often considered to be the crown jewel of the Frank Lloyd Wright Design Campus here. The Annie Pfeiffer Chapel is also the first and oldest building of Mr. Wright's design to be constructed on the grounds. The interior and exterior of the building soar upward, creating a space within that truly embraces the sun and sky above. Meanwhile, the walls of the building are constructed out of Mr. Wright's unique concrete textile block system with over 50,000 pieces of colored glass filling the walls, handcrafted and hand inserted one at a time. The use of colored glass inserts within Mr. Wright's ornate textile block system is totally unique to our campus. You will find it nowhere else across his entire career. Want to see more? Visit Frank. Flexibility and effort is very flexible, uh, but the effort of planning is tremendous. <laughs> Versatility and form making geometries, they are different brake configurations, different types, different products. They come to help you mold your buildings. The one of these called the lady break, you can actually create a new kind of interlocking patterns of break wall or break structure. The transportation of a brakes can be very easy. You can actually construct them entirely, prefab, and shift this to the site. So the crane can actually handle that, begin the building process. If the weather is not permitted, somewhere maybe too hot, too cold, this type of construction is different. But they're very easy to transport. The next thing I want to talk about is embodied energy. Embodied energy is the sum of all the energy required to be produced any goods or services considered as if that energy were incorporated or embodied in the product itself. So I want to watch you watch a little video. Embodied energy, what's that? Everyday items consume energy before we even use them. Especially for their manufacturing as well as for transportation and storage. This kind of energy is called embodied energy. It is hidden almost everywhere. For example, in a bar of chocolate. To produce 100 grams of chocolate, approximately 250 watt hours of embodied energy are required. With the same amount of energy, 
Noodles can be cooked 20 times. The smartphone contains embodied energy as well. Impressive 220,000 watt hours or 220 kilowatt hours. This is so much energy, a phone could be charged for 50 years. Cars have already spent a lot of energy before their homes even drive one meter. Today's mid-range car consumes 30,000 kilowatt hours of embodied energy. With this energy, the car drives 36,000 kilometers. For instance, five times from Ankara to Amsterdam and back. Okay, that gives you some ideas what embodied energy is. So there are things that we need to consider in embodied called EE, the e, consumer. Manufacturing, transportation, installation, maintenance, and damage. So they give a number called GJ by carbon footprints. So you're looking at the the red points, okay, but facing brake is 0.7, mortar is 0.84, and you look at the aluminum alloy, 200, rubber, structure steel, are much higher. So the body energy of a facing brake with mortar are very, very marginal, very, very small numbers. And you look at the other two, Compared to the timber frame, the, the wood has so little because 0.48, because the trees, and they're very lightweight, take less to be transported. And that's why it only so long. But masonry is still pretty good compared to structure steel, aluminum alloy, glass. One of the things with the insulation value of a masonry, and you look closely, there is no number. Why? Because they are talk about the thickness. So without thickness, you can't compute with the numbers. So, but but you know they, you, you look at the concrete block, the thickness how to take into the insulation value, the insulation the value. But for masonry wall, we actually can add insulation in between the width. We can add rigid insulation to further enhance the insulation value of your masonry wall. And this is called the thermal drain set flush, and this, this is the products. And I think what happened is also able to drain the water with the insulation embedded in between the weak of the amazing wall. Now fire ratings, if we want to achieve greater fire rating, all we have to do is make them thicker. Make them thicker. We increase the space in between, hence we increase the fire rate now. And we don't even have to uh, spend too much of materials when we're able to achieve that design. Now the way we work with Intos, which is the opening of masonry construction, there are several approaches. I'm not talking about the cobra, the cobra man. We're not talking about arches yet. These are the traditional way we enhance. We're putting more strength to the lintels. We can use uh, W flange and W flange with T channel, right, T shapes, and we can put a break in between and that enforce, reinforce the opening, the top part of, of the little opening. We can also use reinforcement bars or we can use bond beam, or we can use post tensions, pre-tension, post-tension uh, concrete. Yeah. 
Okay. This is one word in Latin. It's called opus cementatium. Okay? Now, opus, opus actually translates in English, it's not Roman. <laughs> it's actually all those signs. And the cementatium, which is cement. So that's what is cement, cement, cement concrete in Latin. And this is called Roman concrete. Now why, why is Roman concrete in this lecture? Because I tell you why. Because Roman concrete, like the name, is actually translated not into Roman concrete, it's called magical concrete. Why is it so magical about Roman concrete? Well, they have been stained. The Roman structure is stained. 2,000 years of history. The proof is worthless. The one thing with the Roman concrete is the Roman cement is healed. Now you said, what does that mean? Well, for example, if you see crack, next day or next week, the crack will be self healing. Oh, that sounds like magic. But it's indeed a magic process because they're very strong. They're also healable. So, one question you will be asked why, why do we use them today? Why, why, you know, we, can, you know, we can make every building healable. Why can't we? Well, first of all, the formula got lost. And since the uh, collapse of the woman and, uh, and the consistency is not there anymore. But there have been publications, books about the process. They have used animal facts. They have used different systems. They also heat up the line, the volcano ashes, and mix it with water. They also put blood inside. You know. There's a lot of blood. In well, one thing is with the blood. Blood don't increase, unfortunately, it doesn't increase the strength of concrete. Imagine what that would be happening. <laughs> but they actually prolong the setting of concrete. So it makes it more workable. But one of the problems with Roman concrete is it takes a very long time to set. Now, we typically in all concrete, in the laboratory test, what, what is the date that we have to achieve for, for company to do a test, a standard test? Seven days is the earliest. This is probably early strength concrete. The normal concrete is 20 days. Okay? Let's take my time. So, can we wait that long? It's not one thing. Uh, but blood doesn't help. Doesn't help. Increase the strength of our country. But they have, they have the, the Romans. They know how to do it. <laughs> They're very smart. <laughs> and they have found a way to add ambitious to concrete. So they have the master of concrete. All right? So they this reason why their structures are able to last thousands of years. One of the things in the earlier, they found out the concrete. The sand the, uh, has a large aggregate, like what a lot of stones they found in it. And actually, in reality, they thought it's imperfection because the craftsmanship is bad. Reality of it is not, it's actually purposefully added to more. <coughs> so they never crack. They're hard to crack. And also, they adapt the environment better than all concrete today. And very fortunately, the scientists is still trying to put together the formula of the magic of Roman concrete. Louis Kahn, the estuary, you had shown had his name one. He actually used a lintel with rain embedded into the concrete. 
and has the concrete wrapped around it. Next one I'm talking about is coupling. Coupling process is using the many uses in mainstream construction. Uh, one of is spent in the door opening. So one of the break is on top of each other. They dissolve the stress. So this is coupling is really not an arch. It's really a cleverness of arrangement of a break for them to be holding, give you the illusion of the extrusion. They also call the false vaults and call false arches because they really are not arches, but rather than this level of position of the face. And typically they're very heavy. Share the way the water very effectively because they have several layers. Okay, the arches. The next thing is the stone masonry. We will get the stone from and we slice them to one of the factory and that actually produces stone. And it needs to spin them out, cut them out, and the machine. Uh, one of the uh, music can we use the uh, natural stone to produce, and they actually utilize uh, steel, insides using the steel for being. But put outside of like a concrete box. The terminology of arches, because the arches can span a very long distance. Uh, you have the top is called the crown. You have the central, which is called the axis. This is a very important part of your arches. And because this will determine the forces of the span, the long span, the short span, 
underneath is the surface, and between the between the major arches, and there's the riser. I'm gonna do this very briefly, okay? Two minutes and show you. There's no motor joints, and it's one of the experiments we use. And they actually hold together very, very, very solidly. I'm just gonna do it very quickly. The use of a physical model can show you how little of the stone is needed for an arch to be stable. The idea comes from an engineer called Barlow in the 1840s. So it's a proper arch, the flat-faced boussoirs, but you see we put these slats of wood in between them so that the gap stays parallel. Now, let's take a... Between each block, there are equal and opposite forces, and these forces must pass through the wooden slats. They're the only point of contact. Although you can't specify the exact magnitude or direction of these forces. But you can see what's happening. The arch is still perfectly stable. These two faces are staying parallel. That's the face of the abutment and the face of the boussra. And they're being held above just by that very thin slip of wood. So in fact, the thrust has to be there. And lastly, we come here and that's loose. That's loose, and we're down to one slip of wood, so that's all the blocks in the arch are being separated just by one slip of wood in each, and that's certainly where the thrust is running. So the arches, which is early form of vaults, because the vaults you have are multiple arches. So one of the things is called the centering or centering is called a false work, which looks just like that one over there. We have a close picture to look at, which which is a temporary false work that help the motor joints to be solidified and dry and become stronger. The smaller the smaller arches you don't really have to worry. You don't really need but the larger one does need the centering or centering, this piece. Uh, today we can actually use plywood, the cut plywood with the arch and, and the whole lot building like that. But in the past, in many thousand years, the way of plywood, plywood is re-engineered. So they're very strong. And we only have them daily. But <laughs> this is what actually they use. And they look exactly like this thousand years ago. The, the top of the wood, the strip of wood, is called closed leggings. And you have the barrel, which come with triangular configuration. Then you have the timber props, the timber legs. Folding wedges, these two wedges, holding up the height. And then you have the ribs and the tie, holding the outer trust forces. So there's a nickname for Louis Kahn. Not woman, I said, please. But yeah. there's another name. Can anybody name a nickname for Louis Kahn? But get five points from the visit chance. Oh, 
Oh, the other class is too. I will tell you from that in the class. All right, too late for your internet search. <laughs> the answer is very simple. It's called Brain Whisperer. Brain Whisperer. He talks to brains. Like I talk to computer. You know, and, and people say, well, look, this on top of my computer behave different. Because I talk to them. I monitor the temperatures every minute, every second. Louis Carl talked to Greg. So we have a nickname for him. Greg's Whisperer. <laughs> the dialogue with Greg. There's a little article published in the 70s. And I want to read this. It's very, very interesting. So you say to Greg, what do you want, Greg? And the Greg says to you, I like an arch. And you say to the Greg, look, I want one too. But arch is expensive. I can use a concrete window over you, over and over me. And then you say, what do you think of that break? Break is safe. I like an arch. <laughs> Interesting. Today we continue the experimentation of masonry construction. We build the reverse arches, we build the reverse vaults, we use many exploitation. They're gonna continue in the future because it's such a marvelous, wonderful materials to use. The vaults taking the formation of multiple arches. We are very near the end of our uh, lectures. The timber vaulting is by this architect called Rafael Cascavino. And he brought the system. He, he's not the inventor, but it was actually widely used in Europe. He brought this to America. What the difference is the timber vaults called the Castavino's tiles are very thin layers of ceramic tiles that actually interlocks to create a form of similar to vault. But it's more versatile. It doesn't have that dramatic pitch, but they have a very, very organic curve that can be maintained. Um, this is one of the experiments done and you use three layers of bricks. You first will create the foundation, the interior, using Casavino bricks, a brick tile. And then you have a cemented, the brick, another layer, cemented to five layers. So it's a very thin layers of bricks. The result is spectacular. The importance of uh, Castavino's nation uh, is no phone was needed, no false or no whatsoever. So everything can be hanged with very simple framing, false words. And the brake can be constructed, the roof can be covered, can be constructed over it. And that's the wonder of the system. Small balls can be done very easily by a two person or one person. I would like to end the lectures with a great architect called Bronowski. Bronowski Flippon is a 15th century architect. His position is as great as Frank Lohrell today, perhaps greater. Now he constructs the cathedrals in Florence, 
Now he is an inventor, sculptor, painter. I'll give you another five points if you can answer this correctly. One of Filippo's greatest invention. If you can name that, give you another five points. The double shell dome. The shell dome. No. The greatest. One of his greatest achievements in architecture. He's a builder too. What the architecture. Linear perspective. Oh. He created linear perspective. Now with certain procedures of Florence, he did something unthinkable. He created this, you know, two layers of dome. It's really not a dome, it's actually a complicated dome. With two layers. So there are ribs structures inside and the exterior will be the helicon patterns of rays on the exterior. So hence the elimination, total elimination of any false works, only form works, what's that? Really? And you can spend minimum hundred and thirty built between 1420, 1446, 26 years. But you think 26 years is very long time. It's actually not. Not to the temple of God. Take longer. So we have a master builder. We have an engineer, proper engineer. We have somebody dedicated to material science. And we have Bonavisky's talent. And then this is what we have. The equation of success. And this concludes our lecture.